Hey guys, it's Ivory. Welcome back to my channel. I am here today with a much anticipated video about my journey to become a psychologist and specialize in neuropsychology. So I guess because my Instagram page has been growing lately, I've been getting a ton of questions about my journey to get my PsyD and about specialization in neuropsychology. And it gets a little overwhelming to respond to all of those questions, especially when you have 10, 15 questions I can only respond to a couple. I had already wanted to do maybe a three-part series about kind of surviving undergrad and grad school and postdoc, and I probably will still do that in the future. But right now, in this video, I am just going to talk about my journey to getting my PsyD and to specializing in clinical neuropsychology. So if you're interested in that, then come along for the ride. <laughs> video up into a couple of parts. So first I'm going to talk about undergrad, then I'll talk about grad school, then I'll talk about postdoc, and along the way I'll be answering some questions that I get pretty frequently. I can already tell that this is going to be a long video, but if I have time then I will address some other frequently asked questions. If this video is going too long though, then I'm just going to make a second video later on that is specific for frequently asked questions. And keep in mind that later on, I'm probably still going to do that three part series about surviving each step of the way. But today is just going to be talking about my particular journey. So before we even get started, I think it's important to talk about what is a psychologist and what is a neuropsychologist. A psychologist is someone who has obtained an advanced degree in psychology. And there are so many different types of psychologists. You have a clinical psychologist, a counseling psychologist, an organizational psychologist. There are a health psychologist. There are just so many different types um, and you can specialize depending on your interests. Psychologists typically do not prescribe medication, although we do have prescribing privileges in some states. Um, and the states vary in terms of what you have to do in order to be able to prescribe in those states. But for the most part, we do not prescribe medication. Um, many of us do do therapy in the typical sense that you would think of when you think of a psychologist or a therapist. Many of us do do therapy. Um, we are also able to do assessment and the extent of those assessments that you are qualified to give depends on your training. Some of us conduct research and that also depends on uh, your interest and your training. And then when we think about a neuropsychologist, that is someone who has the foundation in clinical psychology and has chosen to specialize in neuropsychology. And neuropsychology is the study of the relationship between the brain and behavior. So basically what I do is consider how a person's central nervous system or their brain and their spinal cord normally function and how that relates to normal behavior. And then if there is a dysfunction or if something goes awry with the with the central nervous system then what impact does that have on a person's behavior their everyday functioning their emotional functioning let's say you're in a car accident and you get a pretty bad brain injury how does that change the way that you think the way that you behave the way that you feel and uh, kind of your recovery as well so i think about all of those things same thing with things like dementia so i know what normal aging looks like and i know what normal aging does not look like so i think about how is this person's behavior and their functioning different from what i would expect from a normal 75 80 year old person you can also think about things like learning disorders and adhd we can think about like how depression and anxiety may impact the brain changes that go on in the brain with things like schizophrenia you can just think about all kinds of things whatever can impact a person's brain a lot of my job also involves educating the family members and other people in that person's circle so if I was working with children it may be their teachers and their parents maybe even their siblings and other community members oftentimes I work with adults and that could be from 18 years old, so I may still be working with parents, um, or it could be older adults, and then I'm working with their children or their hired caregivers or 
other people within that person's support system. So a lot of it involves providing education to those people about what's going on with their loved one and what we can do to help them improve some of the skills if possible, or if not, then what we can do to best support them going forward. Now that all of that is out of the way, let's talk about how I became interested in psychology and neuropsychology in the first place. So like many people who first become interested in psychology, I really just like talking to people. I really liked just engaging and figuring out why is this person going through this and um, what kind of help or supports are available for that person, how I can be of assistance to that person. And so that initially triggered my interest in psychology way back in let's say high school. I also took a psychology class in high school that I just found completely fascinating to think about how people function and how things that people go through affect them. Uh, and I just, I just thought that, that course was absolutely fascinating and I decided to major in psychology. So when it came time to applying for college, I knew that I wanted to major in psychology. I went ahead and declared that as my major when I first got to college. However, I did not know the difference between psychology and psychiatry, so I went into college pre-med. I quickly learned the difference between psychology and psychiatry, and uh, if you're interested, I will talk about that in a whole different video, but I won't go too deeply into that here because this is going to be long enough already. Um, but I learned that I didn't wanna be a psychiatrist, so I dropped the pre-med. Really, I could have kept the pre-med because I still got a Bachelor of Science and took many, many, many science and math courses uh, that were still on the track to be pre-med. Anyway, I think maybe I was missing like three that I would have needed to be pre-med, but I got a Bachelor of Science in psychology and I had minored in English. A lot of times people ask me about involvement in psychology organizations and getting internships and doing research and undergrad. And I'm gonna be completely honest. I have never been someone who wanted my career to consume my life. And I'm still not that person. I'm still, you know, I make videos about psychology and topics in psychology, but I also make other videos that are just things that are happening in my life. I am still not that type of person who all I can think about or talk about is psychology and my work. I just, I want a, a better balance. And so in college, that was no different for, for me. I actually did not join any psychological organizations. I was not in any type of leadership. I didn't seek out research opportunities, um, partly with the research. I didn't do that because I knew that I didn't wanna get involved in research and I wasn't going to apply to a graduate school that was heavily research focused. I wasn't going to get a PhD. I, I knew that I was probably going to get a PsyD. But definitely research will supplement your application materials. A lot of schools do, um, kind of weigh that heavily when they're thinking about acceptance into their programs. But for me, that wasn't something that I was focused on. Um, I actually was involved in a lot of different organizations, like social groups throughout college. And I also ran track and running track for D1 University. I went to Baylor. That took up a ton, a ton, a ton of my time and energy. And then, you know, again, I was involved in other organizations. So. Um, I was not heavily involved in psychological organizations or anything like that. When it came time to apply for graduate school, I started thinking about it in the summer going into the fall of my senior year. Of course, I knew well before then that I wanted to go to graduate school, um, but this was when I started looking at applications and you know, kind of that whole process. I still didn't know a whole lot about the process of going to graduate school and kind of everything that came along with that and you know kind of how I would need to structure and organize my life in order to best succeed at that but I did have a very good professor um, slash advisor who was really instrumental in helping me along with that process. So he pointed me in the direction of a book. It's a big book that's put out by APA, the American Psychological Association, um, that has a list of their graduate programs. Huge book, 
has over 1500 programs that you can just kind of go through the book, look at their acceptance rates, look at their minimum GPA requirements, look at um, kind of their internship acceptance rates, the tuition, kind of everything that you might want to know about these programs when you're making your decision about who to apply to. I personally knew that I wanted to apply to a program that had a neuropsychology focus. I didn't limit myself to only applying to those types of programs, but I definitely already knew at that time that I wanted to become a neuropsychologist. I had a very personal experience with a family member who sustained a brain injury, and yes, that that whole thing was extremely terrifying, but it was also very interesting. And, you know, I, I really got into it at that point. Something that people often ask me is, is X GPA good enough to get me into graduate school? And I can't really give a firm answer about that. The best thing that I can recommend is to check out that book that I mentioned where they talk about their um, minimum acceptable GPA. And if yours is close to that, then maybe still apply for it anyway, if it's the school that you really wanna to go to. So what I did is my GPA wasn't that great. I had a 3.2 in undergrad because my first two years, um, I just spent time having fun in college. I, I just had a regular college life. Going forward, I knew that, okay, my 3.2 GPA probably isn't good enough to get me into the top schools that I really want to go to. Let me apply for some schools that are a bit of a reach, some schools that I think I will probably be able to get into, and some backup schools that maybe I don't really want to go to, but that I'm pretty sure I could get into just in case. But overall, I applied to nine schools. I got interviews for four of those schools. And I thought those odds were pretty good, actually. Um, and a lot of what you'll hear when you talk to people about how do I get into grad school is that the interview is a really big, important part. If you can get in the door and you can show them that you are a person um, who is personable, who is likable, and who um, just has personality traits and characteristics that will likely get you through graduate school and enable you to be a good psychologist, if you can show that to people while you're interviewing, then you have a good chance of getting into the school. Once you get in the door, they really just wanna know, are you a person? I can't recall all of the schools that I applied to. I definitely know that I applied to, I think it's University of Colorado Denver because they had a really good neuropsychology program. Um, but I only applied to PsyD programs because I knew I didn't wanna get a PhD. I did not want to focus on research. I did not want that to be a huge part of my graduate school experience because I knew that I didn't want to focus on research going forward in my career. I want it to be much more clinically focused. The four schools that I interviewed at and then got accepted into were Indiana University of Pennsylvania, Spalding University, Xavier, and Widener University. And ultimately I ended up choosing Widener University. The big reason behind that was that they had a neuropsychology track. The other big drive for me when it came to choosing Widener over the other programs was that Widener has a built-in internship program. And I'm gonna talk about that a little bit more later, but that was something that I felt like was a big security blanket so that I wouldn't have to go through the national match process and worry about if I was going to get an internship and how long it would take me to complete the program and so on. There are some other programs in the country that have that kind of built-in internship. It's a guaranteed internship. And yes, they are APA accredited, at least the Widener's is. So when it comes to thinking about what program is right for you and choosing the program is right, that is right for you, I would think about tuition, of course. And another thing that I would think about is the average completion time of the program. So when I looked at certain doctoral clinical psychology programs, I saw that their average completion time was six, seven, sometimes even eight years. That can depend on their internship match rate. So I would encourage you to look at that internship match rate and see what percentage of people are matching each year because if they have a lower percentage, then that might cue you into maybe there's something about the program that's not preparing their students well for 
matching for internship and then leading to longer completion times. Could also be um, that they're taking longer to complete their dissertations or for whatever reason, they're just having longer completion times. And I wanted to get my five years and be done with it. I did not want to spend any extra time in graduate school than I absolutely had to. I don't know the exact percentage of students who complete Widener's program in five years, but I know that it's quite high. Usually there's some extraordinary circumstance that would require you to stay an extra year, like maybe you decided to take a year off, maybe you got pregnant or just life happened. Um, but for the most part, people are leaving Widener in five years. So that brings me into talking more about Widener's program and my graduate school experience. Most clinical psychology doctoral programs are four years of clinical coursework plus a year of internship. That is different at Widener, again, because of that built-in internship experience. When I say built-in internship, it means that Widener has an APA accredited internship program and they have partnerships with different internship sites um, around the city of Philadelphia, surrounding areas, Delaware, New Jersey, um, throughout Pennsylvania. You are guaranteed an internship. So we still had to go through a match process of sorts, and we were still competing with students from other schools for those slots. That being said, if you did not match through that process, they would still find a way to get you an APA accredited internship and that you would have to be creative about how to do that. The Widener's program is a five-year program. You start practicum immediately. That September that you get to campus, you start practicum. And so you have three years of practicum. I think it's a nine month rotation each. And then you have two years of part-time internship, which is different from the typical structure of how psychology doctoral programs do their internship. Um, so instead of doing four years of coursework and one year of five day a week internship, we did three year of coursework with practicum. And then our last two years were still full course load of work and also three days a week of internship for both of those years. And so with that, we kind of got double the experience because our fourth year of the program, we matched for one internship site. And then the fifth year, we rotated at a different internship site and had to do that whole match process all over again. So kind of when you think about it, when you add up those two years of experience, we technically had six days a week of internship. So my practicum experiences consisted of my first year, I was at a private practice, which was a neuropsychology practice, um, mostly focusing on children and adolescents. So I dove straight into neuropsych my first year. I wanted to get my feet wet, um, especially because in Widener's program, you can't start your actual neuropsychology coursework until your third year. So I was really anxious and I wanted to go ahead and start doing some kind of neuropsych training immediately. Also, there are different requirements that you need to meet with your practicum and internship as you go throughout. One of those was to work with children, and I knew that in my career, I did not wanna work with children, so I just wanted to get that out of the way as soon as possible. And so that was my first year of practicum, and yes, I did enjoy it. Working with kids is a whole other beast. My second year of practicum, I was at a drug and alcohol rehab center. Oftentimes, it was uh, comorbid, depression, anxiety. They were there maybe three to four weeks at a time. And so I did short-term therapy there. I also ran or helped co-facilitate some of the depression and anxiety groups. During this rotation, I was the, I think I was the only practicum student and then there were three interns with me or it could have been me and another practicum student and then two interns. I just know that there were four of us sharing a small office um, and at least two of them were interns at the time. So I did have um, upperclassmen to help me along the way while I was there, which was really valuable. So when thinking about your practicum sites, your internship sites, um, think about if you're the only person there or if you will have someone there who can provide insight and kind of also provide an additional layer of 
unofficial training and sometimes it's actually official supervision for them but um, you know, just having other people there who were a step ahead of me was really beneficial for my training, I felt like. And also we could kind of go through this together um, and bounce ideas off of each other and, and really help each other grow in that way. My third year, I was at a long-term inpatient psychiatric facility and um, I was working with individuals with schizophrenia, um, schizoaffective disorder and other psychiatric disorders. So I did individual therapy, I did some assessments, and I also um, helped to run and facilitate some groups. A big part of your experience throughout training as well is learning to work with other providers in whatever setting that you're in. So I worked throughout all of these uh, placements, except the private practice, it was really just us. Um, but in my second and third year, I really learned how to work with nurses and the psychiatrist um, and just other people that were on the treatment team, social workers, kind of everybody. And so you're really a part of a team in a lot of these settings. And that's an experience that um, is definitely valuable and you will definitely need as you go throughout your career. Then we get to internship. Being in the neuropsychology track at Widener, my internship years needed to focus on neuropsychology. So for my first year, I was at a private practice. We worked with people across the lifespan. So from children to older adults, um, conducting neuropsychological assessment. And my second year of internship, I was at a hospital in Philadelphia. I saw people both inpatient uh, for epilepsy evaluations as well as outpatient for kind of everything under the sun. I did wanna just briefly talk about the pros and cons of doing internship in the way that I did at Widener University, which is the way that it is at Weiner with the built-in internship. The pro is obviously that you just have an internship that is guaranteed. You don't have to worry about going through the national internship match process and possibly having to relocate for your final year and also finish dissertation and whatever else is going on. That can be a big source of stress for people. One, if you don't match and then two, when you do match and then having to relocate across the country for that one year before you then go to your postdoc and and having to relocate again probably and then having to relocate again once you actually find a job so that's a lot of moving that i just did not have to do with that built-in internship and i guess the con would be that your choices are limited in some respects because there are amazing internship opportunities across the country um, and we do not have partnerships with those internship programs across, across the country and obviously it would be hard to do that when we're still in class two days a week. Definitely we had amazing opportunities within our built-in internship but there are also great programs throughout the country that we just did not have access to because of the nature of the program. I want to talk about some of the hurdles in graduate school. So I cannot speak to writing a master's thesis. I never had to do that, so I can't speak at all to doing that. Through my graduate program, it was a built-in, you get a master's along the way after your third year and you complete your comprehensive examinations and then you go on to complete the final two years and you get uh, you get your doctorate so comps or comprehensive evaluations it was the summer between our third and fourth year huh comps is a huge hurdle where you basically have to know everything that you learned for the first three years. There's no real other way to put it other than you just have to know everything. You have to study everything that you've ever learned for the past three years because it could be on these evaluations. Now, I will say that every program does comps differently. I know some programs that have multiple choice. I know some programs that allow you to revise some of your answers if you did not pass and then you can still pass. The way that ours was set up is that there were, I think five, I'm trying to think. I think that there were five different evaluations. We took two in one day, two in another, and then I know neuro 
was the last one and it was by itself, probably for good reason. It was broken up into like history and systems and then like social um, and then like human development or I think lifespan development and then like statistics and research. And I think that that's the way that it was broken up. I, I have tried to block this from my memory because it was traumatic. They presented you with a prompt or question. You got a blue book and then you basically had to just answer the question and just write whatever you knew about it. So it could have been something like compare and contrast the theories of Watson and Erickson or Descartes and Aristotle. It could have been something like that. It could have been write everything you know about how schizophrenia affects the brain, or it could have been here is a scenario, um, here's a description of a person, here's all their information. Talk about the different um, aspects of their identity and how they play together and so on and so forth. There was no multiple choice. We just basically had to regurgitate everything that we knew about that topic. So when it came to studying for that, there was no, nothing else to do other than just learn, relearn everything that we had already learned over the past three years. And of course there were, um, you know, kind of a little bit of guidelines of here's an outline of what you should 100% for sure be studying and, you know, kind of be prepared to know. And there were also study materials handed down from years past, you know, things that they had studied and questions that they had prepared for in even previous exam questions. Um, but basically you just had to be prepared for whatever. I passed all of the sections of comps on the first try. The study schedule for that was pretty extensive and that's something that I can talk about in more detail in a different video. Um, but I did pass on the first try all of them because I was not about to do that again. Um, but you know, there are people who did not pass on the first try and that's fine. You know, you're not gonna get kicked out of the program, but you do um, have to retake it and hopefully you'll pass on that, on that try. Another hurdle that we had to do was oral examinations. And so for this, um, we had to present two cases. One was a therapy case and one was an assessment case. For the therapy case, uh, we did have to record it. We had to get the patient's consent, obviously, to record and be able to present this to our committee, um, our evaluating committee. We had to provide them with a transcript as well as the audio recording of the therapy session. Basically, when it came to oral examinations, you gave them your materials ahead of time, and then when you got into the examination, they just asked you questions about what it was that you did, kind of the theory, um, you know, your treatment plan with that patient, the pro maybe the progress that they had made, um, your goals for treatment, um, why did you say this here, and uh, you know, what's your conceptualization of this patient, kind of all of it, um, really assessing your therapy skills. When it came to the assessment piece, same thing, you had to present uh, them with your materials ahead of time. So write up of the background, the assessment measures that you gave, your summary and recommendations and so forth. Um, and then when it came time for the oral examination for that, also um, they kind of just grilled you on what you did, why you did it, um, what the evidence is behind doing that. And um, you know, maybe if you would have done something differently, maybe were, did the test results line up with what you were expecting um, given XYZ particular disorder. But basically, they just grill you about these two cases to make sure that you have the foundation of the knowledge that you need in order to be able to be a competent professional out in the world. So oral examinations for us, were in the fall of our fifth year. Dissertation is the other big hurdle that honestly, I'm, I'm gonna be completely honest, when it came time for me to think about applying to graduate school, I almost didn't apply just because I didn't want to do a dissertation because it just sounded like the word, it just sounded like something that I didn't want to do. It just sounded like the hardest thing in life to write this tome of whatever it is, whatever topic it is that you research. I defended mine in April of my fifth year. 
My dissertation was on concussion reporting and the influence of perceived pressure on a person's reporting of their concussion or concussion symptoms. I'm not gonna to talk too much about dissertation or give too much advice about that. I can definitely go into that and kind of just all of the hurdles of graduate school in a different video. Like this video and comment down below if you would like to see something like that. What I will say is that it is important to have people on your committee who will be able to support you. So someone who knows something about the topic that you were researching, someone who maybe knows something about statistics or get additional help outside of that. Definitely have people who are going to be able to give you feedback about what you're writing and not just kind of say, okay, yeah, everything looks good because then what if it doesn't look good? <laughs> and you know, you can, you can just feel really um, stuck in certain moments if you don't have people on your committee who are definitely going to um, provide you with good feedback along the way. All right, and we are getting down to the end, so let's talk about church when I go home. Switch flow like clothes, it's a no no be a mo sorry. You can call me mo price, mo life, mo life, grow right. What's wrong? I don't know, but I bet it's your opinion that you think about the beginning and the ending. I be dreaming about nightmares of the fiend, straight bleeding out. I woke up in aviation, guess I made it out. It's a whole nother round, still the same bout. Switch flows like clothes, it's a no no be a mo sorry. You can call me mo price. Mo life, oh life, girl, right, what's wrong? I don't know, but I bet I make it. Elevate your soul.